and welcome back to the second segment of our show this morning. We are switching gears into a conversation on the child protection system and government's response. We have with us on the set this morning, uh, Ms. Margaret Nicholas. She's the executive director of the National Committee for Families and Children. Good morning. Good morning. In the middle, we have Liane Arthurs. She is the director of the Department of Human Services. Good morning. Good morning. And on the far right, we have Diana Shaw, the executive director of the Child Development Foundation. Good mm. morning, ladies. Good morning. Good morning. This is such a broad topic, mm. the mm. child protection system. Where do we begin from in terms of your individual roles and, of course, the collective outlook at protecting children? <laughs> okay, um, well, I guess as Belize is getting ready to celebrate um, 30 years of the mm -hmm. Convention on the Rights of the Child, it's quite an appropriate topic for us to look at a, a kind of taking stock yes. of mm -hmm. where we are. No? Um, and when you look at the system, it's exactly that, a system of agencies mm -hmm. that wrap around um, core delivery for children. And we recognize that indeed children don't exist in a vacuum, mm -hmm. that children are formed as part of a family. Mm -hmm. So how can these system of agencies support families in doing what is their responsibility in terms of parenting and protecting their children? And so when we look at the law, the law yeah. specifies certain core responsibilities to select agencies such as mine, mm -hmm. Department of Human Services. <coughs> we along with the police department are defined as the core agencies to respond yeah. to a concern. Mm -hmm. So if there is a suspicion of abuse or neglect, then we are obligated um, to respond. Yeah. Um, some of the identifiers in terms of abuse would be like the Ministry of Education, where children spend mm -hmm. majority of their days. Yeah. Um, the Ministry of Health, if a child goes in with an injury, would, always, would also be a referral source. Yeah. And as we begin to look at interventions for families, we then draw upon our um, NGO support yeah. bodies like CDF, NAPCAN, YES, YWCA mm -hmm. to also do that type of, of support work mm -hmm. as well for children. Mm -hmm. so, so just to be clear in terms of representation, we have three layers of, of uh, um, agencies here. We have the direct response by government, the human services. We have uh, NCFC, which is a coalition of all agencies and NGOs that work with kids mm -hmm. Um, and, and you're kind of coordinator of efforts. Mm -hmm. And then Diana, you are from the NGO world uh, where you are a separate entity that still works with children, sometimes in coordination with government. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to be clear of, of the different representations that we have here. But I, let me bring it back, because you know, Liana, you said it very clearly that we are about to celebrate 30 years of Belize's signing the Convention on the Rights of the Child. Um, and we've had quite a few prominent issues in the news, for example, in the media, mm -hmm. social media as well, uh, looking at some of the threats that exist for our children. And I want to start off there with you taking stock 30 years later. What concerns you most about what's happening with our children today? Whoever feels comfortable jumping in first. As the um, National Committee of Families and Children um, and being the the actual convener of uh, child protection system yeah. mm -hmm. and particularly looking on the Convention on the Rights of the Child. As I look back uh, 30 years, almost 30 years now, um, what concerns me still is that even though we have made a no, uh, you know, quite a number of strides has been made, um, I, still, I still feel that our children are somewhat under attack. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and it really bothers me. And it bothers me particularly <coughs> when um, stakeholders and others who know better, you know, sometimes seem to be supporting <coughs> some of the negatives that mm -hmm. is happening with our children. Yeah. And I also, um, it also bothers me that um, parents have somewhat seemed to move away from, continue to move away from their responsibilities, you know, and keep relying more upon the state and whereas um, the state does have a duty, the, the, the primary responsibility is with the parents. Mm -hmm. And so I believe that um, notwithstanding all that has been done, that there's still a whole lot more to, to do. Yeah. But I think in particular, um, we really need to start to look seriously 
Not that we are, 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 because I know we have been doing parenting for a long time, mm -hmm. but since we have standardized the whole issue of parenting, I think it's not only <coughs> parenting alone, but I think we have to start to hold people responsible. And I think we have to start to, f to hold parents responsible. We need to start to hold agencies responsible. We need to hold whomever responsible and accountable for what is going on with our children. Because um, 30 years later, our children should be in a better position. And so for me, um, trying to comply with the Convention on the Rights of the Child, making sure that children know their rights and their responsibilities. Mm -hmm. Because um, we make sure that when we teach rights, we teach responsibilities, as well as respect. Mm -hmm. Because um, the, uh, the, uh, the three R's go together, yeah. you know? Um, so I, I, I really actually am, I'm concerned that our children are still in institutions, they're still in prisons, yeah. and that kind of thing. That, that really and truly bothers me a lot. Is it to say that <clears throat> ideally you would want to see that be done away with? Yes. Or from a realistic perspective that you will have children who are quote unquote in the system, so to speak. Those who are difficult to get through to either by their parents or by agents of the state who are tasked with dealing with these kinds of children? Well, uh, who's, we'll go ahead. You. Go <laughs> <laughs> From the NGO perspective, as a community-based organization, we work directly with families. And mm -hmm. we are sometimes at the forefront res responding and then reporting back to government agencies what mm -hmm. we are seeing in communities in terms of family dynamics and mm -hmm. the change in patterns that really cause some of these things to happen. What we are seeing 30 years into the CRC is that there's a lot of knowledge about the CRC. People mm -hmm. know what the CRC <coughs> is and people know what the rights of children are generally. But we are seeing that that has not resulted in a change in behavior mm -hmm. and a change in cultural practices. Mm -hmm. And that is the concern. We're, how do we move now from knowledge to change behavior. The first phase of rolling out the CRC, we emphasized the knowledge aspect because we needed people to know this was a completely new platform, a new way of thinking, but now people know. So now, as Ms. Nick was mentioning, we need to now bring in the enforcement aspects to force the change in behavior because we are seeing the hope was that this would become something that would flow automatically from more increased mm -hmm. awareness, that behavior would change, but that is not happening because people are resistant more than we thought they would be. We anticipated some resistance, but the resistance is greater than we thought they would be. Mm. And I think part of why the resistance is so great is because there is a lack of uh, understanding that there are consequences for abusing children, that parents still feel that this is somehow their right to abuse a child and that there are no consequences. So from the NGO perspective, what we want to see is a lot more enforcement of the laws and of the policies that are there, that where police are responding, they're not just talking to the parent and giving them a warning and letting it go. They're charging people, investigating, bringing it to court. People are being convicted for abusing children. This becomes public knowledge so that it deters others. We want to see much more of that because we don't see that enough. And this also as a pushback on children, because now children are learning about their rights in school, and then it's not being enforced. So it's like, well, why are you teaching us about rights? Why do you guys come here and talk to us about children should participate and we should have a voice? Because when I go home, my mother will slap me and nothing will happen. Mm -hmm. So from our perspective, we want to see a lot more enforcement, because we realize now that the awareness has happened, but it has not resulted in change behavior. And so one of the functions of law and legal mechanisms is to force change where it doesn't flow automatically. And we want to see more of that. And that comes, I think, also with changing some of the people in the system. Because we have still stakeholders who are police, um, teachers, um, judges, who, who still don't feel that this is something that they should hold people criminally accountable for. Do you feel that <clears throat> this is a particularly difficult challenge simply because <clears throat> As you've pointed out, you have people within the system who are very much staunch in their way of thinking and perhaps traditional in the way they see things. You have perhaps people who grew up under certain uh, practices or beliefs yeah. 
and they hold on to that rigidly in terms of dealing with children. Do you find that being able to effect that change has been rather difficult? It has been, but there has been some success. As an NGO organization, where we have seen the most success is where we can really work on long-term relationships with families. Mm -hmm. Where we can coach families in parenting and then provide counseling support. Because the other connection to this that is now coming out, and we still need to do a lot more research, is that there is a connection to how people parent in how they were raised. So parents who are abusing children using inappropriate disciplinary methods grew up on the inappropriate disciplinary methods and really have never learned a different way. Yeah. And so there's a lot more that we need to do to engage families and we need to shift investment um, from the awareness, even though we still need to do that, to more bringing along that coaching support where we yeah. walk alongside families for a longer period mm -hmm. to change behavior and to really get them the kind of supports that they need. Yeah. And it's expensive to do that. You know, and, yeah. and you, you said earlier, they always say, you know, when you become a parent, there's no manual, but now there is, at yes. least in Belize. Yes. <laughs> yeah, there is a guy. Um, you created a parenting manual. Um, clearly won't respond to every issue that a parent goes through. Mm -hmm. but, but what is the purpose and how do you get it into the hands of the people who really need it? Well, I, th I think the whole, that is the whole idea of trying to get it into the hands of, of the persons who really need it because we cannot sit in a classroom. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We cannot sit in an auditorium, ad auditorium. You know, we have to be out there. Yeah. I mean, the other day we went to Dan Gregor and we were able to, to, to really and truly meet a lot of grassroots people yeah. who were able to be a part of that process and who are now demanding more, you know, because they found out that it is necessary. And so um, it has to be the rovers, it has to be yes. everybody who is doing this business. So it has to be whether it's under the coconut tree, it has to be whether it's in the rural areas, wherever. And that is the whole purpose of standardizing it yeah. and ensuring that what, because one of the things that we did with that guide was to do a socialization of it with people from across the country, mm -hmm. inviting everybody into one era. What we're also trying to do is to get a cadre of facilitators and trainers. Mm -hmm. I, I think what is very important, however, is that um, people who are training and, and, and facilitating that they're at the level of where people are. Yeah. You no, know, because we have to be careful, you know, we, because, because the guard itself is not enough. Mm -hmm. We will have to be able to improvise. We will have to be able to use experiences and so on and so forth mm -hmm. to help people to understand yeah. and to get to where people are. Yeah, because parenting in Belize City will be different from, from parenting what it is, in right? a yeah. exactly. rural village. Yes. Yes. And, and yeah. I think that also, what, because what we are doing the whole of next week is that we have invited ourselves, for instance, to many of the businesses across Belize. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We have invited ourselves to Central Bank, BEL, and all of these different agencies, and they have received us. So we'll be doing trainings with them as well. Yeah. We have invited ourselves to the, to the, to the schools, yeah. <clears throat> to um, different levels of the schools. So they too have invited us in. And so we're hoping that through this kind of process that we'll be able to reach a mass number of persons, you know? Yeah. So because we believe, because we believe that if we get it into customs department or BEL or wherever, because one of our um, one of our um, objective is to see how much more we could even engage fathers mm -hmm. in the lives of their children, mm -hmm. because that is important as well, you know. Um, so it is really and truly looking right across the country and see how well we can get it wherever we can yeah. and whenever we can, whether it's a Saturday, whether it's a Sunday, whenever people are available. That is yeah. how we, we, we tend to move it. And then in relation to the, uh, um, for me, in, in relation to the, um, st the other stakeholders, the, the, like she me mentioned, judges and police officers and so on and so forth, we understand that people were socialized in, in, in certain kinds of ways, no? But I think that the awareness and the training and the investments ought to be able to remove us a little bit from point A to point B, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of changing our mindset, mm -hmm. you know, because I think that at the end of the day, all of us in the child protection system mm -hmm. should want to see the change, yeah. 
Mm -hmm. We should want to see that change. We should want to see, because what it will do, you know, we have always been told we need to work ourselves out of a job. Mm -hmm. So that is what we need to do, to work ourselves out of a job, because we're working with the same Six of people over there. We need yeah, to, you shouldn't to have to be there. busy. That you, means you, you know, mm -hmm. because you know. So I am thinking that wherever you sit, I, I know. The, early, early this year, they did a whole training for judges and magistrates and prosecutors on child rights, mm -hmm. human rights, yeah. and that kind of thing. And I think anybody who works in a child protection system should be very cognizant of all of these international um, instruments yeah. because it really and truly sets the stage. And some of them are incorporated into our, our domestic legislation. So I believe that we, we need to know them and we need to practice them as well. Because it is going to make your jobs, a whole, our jobs, a whole lot easier. What's the training that takes place with the police? Because we can't, we, we can't not talk about the recent incident with the runaway from the hostel. Um, and because that prompted a conversation thereafter where the commissioner <coughs> himself said children have rights but they're not being taught responsibilities. So my question is, uh, what is the interfacing that is taken? It, it's twofold. One, you have the head of the police saying this, um, which, which people then accept to be the truth. Um, but secondly, we also have an issue with older children, teenage children who come in conflict with the law or sometimes even are victims of sexual assault. Mm -hmm. And we, we judge them very differently than the four or five year old who may be involved in an incident. So let's start off with the interfacing with police and then we talk about children who come in conflict with the law. Um, in terms of, of the treatment of adolescents, as you said, differently than younger children, Definitely that's something that concerns us. Mm -hmm. um, and I think in previous conversations we've talked about this, even in terms of, of culturally, like Diana said, yeah. how people respond on social media. Um, yeah. Victims are often re-victimized. And there's not a sensitivity to the realities of what teenagers have gone through. So a lot of times people see the behavior, which is often the tail end of a long process of trauma that has reached them to this place that they're angry. And they're angry because many times um, there's been failures um, by family to protect them, to give them guidance. We firmly believe that children thrive when you provide them an environment for them to thrive. Yeah. And they will lead once you provide them with the right environment. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so when you see the tail end of a certain behavior, you have to consider what all that child has gone through. And there's no exact science that or once you see that, that means all of them have gone through this. Yeah. A society saying, stop. Something is off here. What has this child gone through? And how do we help this child to reconnect? Because a lot of times there has been a breakdown in terms of connections. Yeah. And that child has lost trust in a system, has lost trust in anybody who says that they have their best interests yeah. at heart. So how can we step back and look at ourselves as a society? Even within the child protection system, you hear the other stakeholders um, say that when they're in the court and there is a jury, mm -hmm. that there is a judgment, that you have to be careful how you dress the victim. They have to prep the victim in terms of how they explain their trauma because mm -hmm. if they say it in the wrong way, the jury might say, well, it didn't happen. The abuse mm -hmm. didn't happen. Wow. And so when did we get there? that we, instead of holding perpetrators, adults accountable, we put all the pressure on children to, to defend their trauma and to wow. defend what has happened to them. You know, I can remember this doctor telling me, he said, Mrs. Arthurs, we have a serious issue. He said, I could tell from those jurors that they wanted to hear blood, ghoul, mm -hmm. assault, beaten. And a lot of times, sexual abuse doesn't manifest like that. Sexual manifests by a grooming process yeah. mm -hmm. where they break down these children's defenses, um, build trust with these children to, to cross process. boundaries. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. and, they, and children are vulnerable. We have to remember that. Mm -hmm. You know, we say, oh, well, then why she went to him when he called her? She mm -hmm. should have not gone. Mm -hmm. This why is a child. The second time. Yes. Mm -hmm. But in a courtroom situation, forgive me mm -hmm. for yeah. asking here. Wouldn't the onus be or part of that responsibility be on the lawyers? Because I'm thinking <laughs> if you are defending someone who has been <laughs> accused of who has been accused of committing a heinous sexual crime on a child, that <clears throat> the, in the lawyer's mind, 
they want full disclosure of what happened so that the jury then can decide whether or not what the child is saying is the truth in so far as how it happened or if anything at all happened. Shouldn't then the lawyer be sensitized or trained or taught or something <laughs> that says you're treading on very delicate grounds when you're dealing with a child who has been the victim of trauma? So this came up, and I can speak specifically to this because I was part of a project, the Juris Project, mm -hmm. two years ago, and I was a consultant that developed um, guidelines mm -hmm. for courts in the Caribbean, specifically on this issue. And that process, we had to consult with a lot of attorneys. And really what we have found is that in a court setting, the responsibility of what happens on, in the court really is the responsibility of the judge. Mm -hmm. The judge manages and administers the court. And what we, we found in a lot of sexual cases, the judges weren't willing to mm -hmm. have a strong management structure of the court system mm -hmm. and allow things that really were unreasonable to happen. So what you're saying is he or she should control how far yes, that would goes. go. Exactly. That Mm -hmm. interview that yes they can stop it they have a mm -hmm. and they have a responsibility to mm -hmm. and belize has signed on to those guidelines and mm -hmm. those guidelines clearly state that one of the first things that need to happen the judge needs to have proper case management hearings mm -hmm. where all of those things are ventilated mm -hmm. where they give directions okay this is we have a situation here where this is going to be a sexual assault we need to hear from the social worker about vulnerability markers for this child whether this child is going to need a support person in court whether we need to have a screen put up, whether mm -hmm. we need to have them give evidence by video link, all of that is already in the law. We already have mm -hmm. the process for it. The judges need to ensure that in administering case management, they are bringing this forward. That is not happening. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The second person that needs to do that is a prosecutor. If the judge is not doing it, the prosecutor then needs to step in to say, we will have apply for case management. These are the issues that we need to have addressed in case management. We need directions from the judge that we're going to have a screen this person need a support person they, we have already provided the statements we want the, the questioning to be along the line of the statements and the protection to be in that witness is not budgeted all of those things can be dealt with that case management this has been done in other parts of the caribbean and so this is not new this is not new science this is something that is being mm -hmm. done as a matter of course in most sexual offense cases in the caribbean the judges here are hesitant to do that. Why? I don't know. Again, I come back to the culture of socialization and their own biases mm -hmm. towards victims yeah. and their own perceptions of what the judicial system is and what the role of the judges. Are there special judges that work on cases like these? Th that has been the recommendation, but no. Um, like, have we, they been sensitized on children's rights? Have they been I think most a of psychological yes. evaluation? Yes. Have been. Imagine they if have a judge been. is a rape victim or a prior trauma victim and seeing a case I like think we have this. gone that far in uh, our I mean, assessment. We, 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 we talked to. about it though mm -hmm. as uh, the Chief Justice had chaired um, the Child Friendly Court um, mm -hmm. yeah. Committee mm -hmm. and through that we have talked about the need to look at that yeah. Yeah. in terms mm -hmm. of magistrates. Yes, because it does affect how you... How well, you I mean, I think one system, of the things yeah. we've had countless conversations about mm -hmm. right here on the show is that we don't have the data to know how many people have survived abuse mm -hmm. um there's an assumption we've all had a conversation at least with one person mm -hmm. who survived uh, abuse and is has never been treated or talked about it or had any kind of recourse. but if we look at the at the data of what we do know in mm -hmm. terms of reported abuse we know that sexual abuse is a second most reported form of abuse mm -hmm. traditionally it was physical abuse but now sexual abuse is far ahead of physical mm -hmm. abuse so we know that for every report there's so many that are not reported so we know we have a huge yeah. issue on our hands and what is telling us about the dynamics in the population well mm -hmm. in that was my point because yeah. i want you you're also talking about the jury mm -hmm. and if we if we pay attention just to the very conversations that take place online which for all the good mm -hmm. and bad that they talk mm -hmm. about at least it gives you a mirror mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. see what the What's society happening? is thinking mm -hmm. and saying mm -hmm. and so while there are some who come in defensive children if we use the example of the child who was manhandled by the police, there were some people who said, listen, it's still a child. Mm -hmm. um, and there were some who said, oh, how disrespectful. So it shows that the different views that exist. But if we see the victim blaming that takes place, I'd imagine, or I, I, I think one can assume that that's part of what the 
mentality that may exist just in a panel of people who may yes. be judging this jury. child mm -hmm. on whether or not they experience this trauma. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's there. There's even discussions about doing away with jury trials for sexual offenses. Some mm -hmm. countries are beginning to do that. It's not necessary to have a jury. You can't have a, a, a trial without a jury. There are countries that are looking at that mm -hmm. as one of the ways of looking at how we deal with ensuring that we create a fair landscape and a fair playing field for both the victim and the defendant. And that is one move that has happened in the Caribbean in some other countries already. This may be something that we need to look at in Belize, whether for our context this is appropriate. If I were to piggyback yeah. on what Marlene was Caution. putting forward, <clears throat> when you look at the jury pool, so to speak, and the fact that these are persons who come from all walks of life, mm -hmm. but their exposure to a matter or a case, based on the fact that social media seems to be that one place where yeah. all the information is collected and disseminated and so persons would come in with certain biases already because they've been exposed to certain information perhaps a family member would comment on their under exactly. a picture or something mm -hmm. yeah. so that when you go in you already know there's something already is already bias. being said yes. so <laughs> perhaps there's in there is indeed that need to Have that do yeah, yeah or yeah. do away with the jury aspect yeah. of it yeah. because people aren't as objective as they ought to be in terms of, of looking at a situation. Yeah. But I that's what I'm saying in terms of... Oh, sorry, sorry. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Two of us are But I was just going to say that in terms of the communication strategy, mm -hmm. how do we, in terms of all the work we've done to educate, how do we flip the switch so that people err on the side of the child mm -hmm. rather than the err on the <coughs> side of the perp? Because mm -hmm. the concern is that, oh, this child must have lied. Why is that the first presumption mm -hmm. that this child is lying rather than you know this child must be telling the truth and that's our concern yeah. is that victim blaming um, and in terms of just to kind of in terms of the criminal cases where we've seen success is when everybody is supporting that yes. child and everybody mm -hmm. understands their role mm -hmm. to support that child you know you put yourself in a child's shoes this is a child mm -hmm. and this child is expected to go into this um, atmosphere where they must mm -hmm. talk about the most difficult thing that they have gone through. Yeah. And as adults, certain conversations are difficult for us, much yeah. less for our child. Exactly. Yeah. And so, you know, when you have teachers who are saying, we're going to testify, you have school wardens saying, I'm going to testify of what I observe. We have parents who are right there saying, I'm holding your hand. We will walk through this together and are with that child every step of the way, the social worker, psychologist, the health professional. When everybody holds that child up, you have stronger outcomes yes. and more successful outcomes. Mm -hmm. And often you get um, the convictions. And of course, let's not forget proper case management in the court. Mm -hmm. yeah. that I, and I could remember with a particular case, I sat through that case because I said, okay, if this doesn't go towards a conviction, I want to understand why, so that we could take stock of the system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I could remember the judge clearly telling the defense attorney, watch it, you're crossing a line there. Mm -hmm. okay. Come, Your Honor, co um, come, counsel, this is a child. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so that defense attorney had to shift yes. yeah. in terms of the questioning of the child. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So everybody has a role to play yeah. 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 in terms of making the system work. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I think, I, I don't know, but you know, I honestly and truly believe that, um, I, I know our constitution, what our constitution says, but I really and truly believe that when it comes to sexual offenses cases, mm -hmm. that there needs to be a, sh a, a serious shift when it comes to the, the, the burden of proof. Mm -hmm. I, still, I still in my mind believe, and I hope one day, mm -hmm. that it will be shifted around where the perpetrator will have to be able to, def to, prove, to, def their to, to prove their innocence. And, and it is something that <laughs> stays. I, 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 as an attorney, I could go that far. <laughs> what I would say, <laughs> what I would say <laughs> is that we need to have the proper support. You know, because I have seen it work. Where we have, as Liane was yeah, saying, but, the know, proper support where the judge understands their role to manage yeah, the courtroom, mm -hmm. the yeah. prosecutors understand their role to front and load the case and everything yeah, prepared before, mm -hmm. do the proper case management, get the proper directions. And I, I then it works better. I agree. But to, to Piggy on Miss Nicholas, many, too I many of them don't get convinced. I would advocate. Well, I, was I, I would advocate. But that's not necessarily a reason. How do we strengthen mm -hmm. forensic 
That's evidence. right. That's, we need to have better cases. And we not have the, that the testimony of the child be yeah. the primary exactly. determination. It should rest on the child. Because the child is too, yes. much, it's too, it's too much of a burden for a yes. child. Man. And that's I, agree with. I agree. And I think that's where perhaps we have not explored. <clears throat> and I'm, I, it still goes back to, I mean, because your first interface, even as a child, will be with the police. Yes. Mm -hmm. And who is collecting the evidence mm -hmm. and taking oh. that first statement as mm -hmm. to what mm -hmm. takes place? They challenge yeah. they are, Do the they challenges know? are great. That I mean, has any, if you've ever given a statement to the police, I have. Mm. I, have. I, mm. I, I think we, we it all has improved. To, we I will say over the 30 years of the CRC, it, has it must be like this. for a child to it, be put in that situation. It, has, it, has, improved. it yeah. has improved because there have been constant the training. training. There has, there has been. Mm -hmm. There has been. And it has to continue. And we want to get it to the stage mm -hmm. of yeah. video recording mm -hmm. yes. so the child doesn't have to repeat. repeat. Yes. And we're currently doing this with trafficking victims yes. for both children and, and adults. Go so we have a platform to yes, build exactly. from. Mm -hmm. yeah. But so that's why I say it has social worker is involved from the beginning or should be. Should be. Yes, should be. Let me just go back to something though because I'm hearing from you you, as people who work in the child protection system, and this is my word, not yours, a sense of frustration with the lack of conviction. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and I think that's a very telling issue. Um, do we have an idea of our conviction rate from reported cases? It's low. I think the it's last low. estimate it's for really sexual low. offenses was less than 50%. It's it very low. low. It's lower than for other kinds of offenses. Mm -hmm. I don't have an exact number, but I know from the research that we have done that it is lower than other mm -hmm. forms of offenses. Okay, so How difficult are the penalties, though? Like, for instance, you get to a it's conviction. Mm -hmm. Is the penalty... Uh, 30, 30%. Is it, does the penalty fit the crime, so to speak, in terms of either the years you get as a sentence? Oh, yes. We have, have improved you? that. Yes. So the amendments in 2014 yeah. to the criminal code mm -hmm. increased most of the penalties for sexual offenses. And mm -hmm. actually now Belize has a stronger legal framework for sexual offenses than some of the other countries in the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. The problem has been those other things that need to happen to get yeah. a conviction. Because you can't just get a conviction from bringing a case. Mm -hmm. yeah. And this is where I think the understanding needs to be that the legal system doesn't work like that. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not bringing the case that ensures the conviction. It's ensuring that you have the, yeah, proper, the proper evidence evidence, to right. support mm -hmm. what is required to establish a conviction. So it's not bringing convention. a true story. It's yes. a true story that you have physical evidence and witnesses that you and can other show people to, be the truth. Mm -hmm. to yes. tell the judge yes. and the jury who, yes. let's just say, may have some victim blamers there yes. and being able to convince. So, so it's not that yeah. it happened to you. <coughs> no, it's, it's, it's more what than you that. have in The addition. legal system requires right. more than that. And yeah. that's the now challenge. Now my mere explanation of that probably just turned away three assault uh, cases. Because they're saying, I don't know if I want to go through it. We haven't even talked about but the, the backlog. But the if problem I report is, it now, when do I go to court with it? Yeah, but this is a problem. Yeah, it shouldn't <coughs> be their responsibility mm -hmm. to do that. Mm -hmm. it, the state agents need to respond to that. And this is where we are seeing it. That they don't feel that it is their responsibility, responsibility. as a police officer to take a better statement, <coughs> to follow through all of this. They believe it's a burden of the victim to go and convince the jury. And this is the change that needs to happen. The people happen. in the system mm -hmm. to needs to recognize that it is not the responsibility of the victim to prove the case. You are the person assigned to collect the evidence, to follow the leads, to put forward the case. It's not the victim's responsibility. So when that shift happens, we will have police officers, doctors, whoever else is in the system doing their part because currently they are just waiting on the victim to go there and be convinced. Yes. And if the victim is not convincing, well, we can't get no conviction. Mm -hmm. that, that can't be the case. Yeah, but be. I mean, this, this is even long, more <coughs> long-term repercussions because we're not just talking about a victim having to go through you know, a failed case uh, or a failed conviction. You're also talking about a perpetrator back out on the street mm -hmm. yes. to just have more victims. Exactly. Yes. <coughs> so exactly. that's the other way the system is also failing the perpetrator <laughs> because we don't have any kind of rehabilitation. Um, rehabilitation <laughs> for sexual offenses has had much less success than any other form of rehabilitation. So you're already starting low. And we are not even yet on the stage where we can even measure zero because mm -hmm. we have none. In fact, we don't even know where they are. Yeah, we don't even know. Yeah. Because so we're supposed to have a sexual offenses registry. I don't know what happened to that as yeah, well. Exactly. So that they would have been um, registered and you could know where they are. No, it's mm -hmm. it's really and truly it's really and truly in 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 my in my opinion um, one of the weakest areas in the whole system. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I think it's because it's about children. It's about because they are vulnerable. It's, it's because 
we don't <coughs> understand the trauma that is involved when a child is sexually molested. It is a lack of stakeholders to support the child. Sometimes it's even a lack of family members to yes. support the child as well. Yeah. And, and, and I totally agree with Diana in terms of trying to move away from the jury system, given the, 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 the influx on the social media and how that is now affecting people's mindset. Mm -hmm. I think that we need a one or two very um, responsible, understanding judge mm -hmm. to sit on these cases. Yes. Not to say that they are going to go there to, to do anything out of the way, but to see the evidence for what it is, to see what is before them and to act accordingly. You know, because then if we depend on a jury, which every time we read on so social media, we see all the demeaning things about young girls mm -hmm. who have been molested, even when they haven't gone <coughs> to the home, mm -hmm. but it happened within their own homes and so on and so forth. Why you never scream? Why you never tell somebody? People don't understand that even when these young children tell their own mothers, Sometimes they are they reprimanded. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. so it's, it's, I mean, this whole, this matter of, of um, sexual abuse is a big problem for our children. And it's not only our girls, it's as well as our boys. boys. Hence the reason mm -hmm. why the criminal code decided that we have to protect all children yeah. irrespective of the, the sex. I mean, if you, you know, think about it, how long was it that a boy couldn't be raped? Until you know, the recent so amendment in the criminal exactly yeah. because because we know that our children are at risk, yes. and it doesn't have anything to do with it. With a boy or girl, we have to put a yeah. child is a child is a child is a child. Yes. And coming back to, I just want to come back to the whole issue of um, the commission of police um, and the the the, the um, statement that he made in relation to teaching rights and without responsibility. responsibility. That is far from the truth. I don't know. Um, Probably he hasn't been to one of our trainings in recent times, no? but we have booklets as well, which speaks about rights, respects, and responsibility. Mm -hmm. And we're t picking them around the schools and so on, and so because we cannot teach rights without, and I agree with it, we cannot teach rights without responsibility. And we have been teaching rights and responsibility. I think 30 years down the road, when the whole ir issue of rights came about, we might have been talking then about only rights. Right. Mm -hmm. But as you develop and as things evolve, you know you have yeah. to include all the three R's. Yeah. It is important that the three R's are taught because if you have a right to education, you have a responsibility to study. Yeah, okay. and to be in school. And to be in school. Mm -hmm. And you have uh, the right to respect your teacher. Mm -hmm. And so is the same thing with your parents. So whatever right you have, if you mm -hmm. have a right to a good health, then you are responsible to eat what is good for you. Mm -hmm. You understand what I'm saying? And so yeah. we have to teach them that as well. Because you can't say you have a right to good health and then you, you encourage them to eat all Drunk. around foods yeah. and so on and so forth. So <coughs> that is what we, we are trying to instill because we also have to help parents in these areas as well. Mm -hmm. You know, because even so, we cannot afford really and truly to bring up children to be disrespectful. We have to help to make the balance. So and I just thing, wanted though. us to know that that is how we are... Um, Teach that we are teaching the three R's, or our booklets are about the three R's. It's and almost as if though we're <coughs> we're encouraging children to enjoy the rights that 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 <coughs> covers who they are, what they are, what they're about, etc. But it's almost as if though as well we're allowing them to kind of run carte blanche with it, though. Why as you it? said, <coughs> there are certain responsibilities. There's always this, I guess it's a biblical expression, to whom much is given, much is expected, right? So you provide this particular framework, the rights, if I may, for them to be able to enjoy. <clears throat> However, I think we as parents are failing to teach them the responsibilities that comes with that right. So it's not as if though we're looking towards, it's not that we should be looking towards the state to be able to administer Direction. What the, the guidance and the responsibilities are to be it starts with us, and that is why if you, if you I don't know if you have ever seen a parenting guide, and I, I, I'm sure that you have, no, but have you? No, well, anyway, if you start at the very beginning of the parenting guide, that is exactly <coughs> what it starts oh, yeah. with. Yes, mm -hmm. it starts right away with the parents teaching them that whole I issue of mm -hmm. rights and responsibility and respect because it's right in there, mm -hmm. right at the very beginning, because that is the that is the whole background, that is the whole back yeah. of, of the whole, the whole guide. Because 
I will say, though, to add to that, <laughs> that as the, the parenting is an art, mm -hmm. and I think that's what the, the parenting mm -hmm. guide is, is also saying. So it's learned behavior. It's and not are we automatic. all artists? And well, we are in some form. <laughs> in some, some of form. us are very bad and some of us are good. <laughs> so that's the problem. We have too many bad parenting mm -hmm. models, yeah. and now we need to help them to shift to learn better parenting models. And this is where I was saying earlier that as an NGO organization, what we have seen that the only way that this happens is with time and coaching. Mm -hmm. That yeah. parents don't change parenting styles just mm -hmm. by learning parenting styles. That they have to be coached that this actually works. Because we do parenting um, workshops, we have parent support groups, and you talk to them about discipline, and they learn all the disciplinary methods. Mm -hmm. But until they actually start doing it, yeah. They don't change their ideas about discipline. So it requires <laughs> that investment in coaching yeah. and supporting parents. And this is where I think that we need to shift investment because we don't invest enough in that. We don't have that. We don't have coming up from UB social workers who are being trained in parenting as part yeah. of social work. Mm -hmm. We don't have teachers that when we're training them in the teaching institution, they're learning parenting and how to teach this in the education system. We don't have that yet. Well, so see, we still know at the beginning question. of the And we're that. going there though. Yeah, that is where we're going. I've always yes. wondered. That's that. where we're going because we have a relation. We have started the discussion with UB, mm -hmm. with, but not UB, UWI. Uh -huh. To, to see how we could get that into into yeah. the um, university. The, 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 this air, we are using this air to really and truly socialize the guide. And we have developed a monitoring tool yeah. that we'll be able to get back feedback as to perhaps what else we need to put in there, what else we need to do. But we have already be, uh, begun a discussion with, with UWI and they have already agreed and we also started a, a bit of it with Galen University mm -hmm. because we believe that it has to go into the curriculum as yes, well. Yeah. You, you know, we, it has to be. Yeah. So that, um, as you were rightly saying, Diana, that whether teachers, social yeah, workers, yeah, that because the whole idea is to ensure that everybody. Yes. Because if we don't do that, I, I agree with you, we will get absolutely nowhere. Because after all, I am a parent. I born my child. I hold this nine months, mm -hmm. and you can't tell me what to do with my child. Mm -hmm. Because that is me, that is my child. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So to get that parent to move away from there, there has to be much more than just one single training, one whatever. Mm -hmm. So It has to be inculcated in has there. To, yeah. It has to be. It has to be. It has to be. It has to be. But see, this is where I'm, I'm a bit concerned, because you, know, you said something, and, and that's why I laughed, because... Fundamentally, we all become our own, our mothers or our fathers. You know, as much as we loved or hated how they parented, um, that's that's what we are naturally inclined because that's what we saw mm -hmm. growing up. That's what we experienced. Mm -hmm. So if we're not taught otherwise on how to handle something, if the child misbehaves, if the toddler has a tantrum, mm -hmm. um, if I'm not taught otherwise how to handle that situation, I'll do what I saw mommy or daddy mm -hmm. do. And so, it's just a completely different time. Mm -hmm. But is. what I find interesting today is that we're going back, and, and maybe, I mean, I don't know who takes responsibility for it, but now I start to hear part of what I used to hear when I was younger. Oh, children have too many rights that it took mm -hmm. away from the parents' mm -hmm. rights. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah. the, the recognition and understanding of children's rights being human rights and you know, parents being humans having the same rights, mm -hmm. it, it seems to have dissipated and somehow we see children as more empowered. Mm -hmm. But if we look at what's happening on the ground, yeah, no. Kids being involved in gangs and crimes and murders and being murdered and being raped. Um, it's not necessarily the case that our children are more empowered. Mm -hmm. So what, what, what are we missing? What, what seems to be the connections that have failed that we need to work on either rebuilding or building? So I would, I would say that for us, this word connection is very important mm -hmm. to us. When we work in our Rise Girls program, a big component of it is rebuilding parenting connections. That we are very much about teaching children about their rights and creating spaces for participation, teaching them about leadership. But we recognize that the child cannot evolve and become who they are supposed to be without parental guidance and support. Yeah. So there is a whole component about it, about communication, how you communicate with your parents, how do you talk about something that's happening in your day. And then we create spaces for that. So like this next week, Saturday, we're going to have mother-daughter taco night, where we will have a night where the mother and daughter can come. We're having it at a nice taqueria in Belmopan. 
they eat tacos, we'll have games, it's a fun mm -hmm. night. Because we recognize that we have to create spaces for connection. Yeah. Because we think we were thinking that that would happen. That you know, once you educate people and you give them the tools, it would happen, but it's not happening. So now we are much more intentional about creating those connection spaces. We have activities where they have to go do a take home communication exercise to talk to their mother for five minutes about something that happened in their day and then they have to come back and share how that was. Then we have activities with the parents where they have to choose yeah. something to do with the mother, yeah. with the child. So things like that, I feel that we have to build more on um, so that we are rebuilding those connections because we have lost those connections. A lot of parents, when they hear about rights, they <clears throat> in, er, immediately get hostile. They yeah, start to think this true. is an adversarial thing. You're coming to tell me don't beat my children. Rights is not about don't meeting a child. You know, it's, it's about ensuring that we have a strong connection between the parent and the child that creates an enabling environment for this child to reach the potential that you as a parent want the child to have. Yeah. So we have to reframe that conversation. It was necessary when we were introducing it to emphasize the rights aspect and that this was a different way of thinking. But as I said before, now that we have covered awareness nationally, I think now we have to think about now how do we change behavior? How do mm -hmm. we rebuild those connections and remarket this in a slightly different way? Yeah, and I think it's the same thing that we do at the National Committee for Families and Children because um, we have had um, Dad and I concerts and Dad and I. Um, and, and the 16th of November, for instance, we are having a family day yes. in Corazon yes. where we will have that kind of connection between yes. um, mom and like dads and, we and, and, and the family as yes. a whole. And it is something that we plan to do throughout the country as a yes. part of the, the parenting strategy, you know, yeah. because we have to we have to do that. Um, the thing is, is that when we talk about particularly when we talk about Article 12 of the convention, where we, we want to invoke that yeah. to make sure that children voices are heard right. and this yeah. kind of thing, you know. It's, it's, it's always sends a little bit of trill up in people's spine. I don't know that, you know, because like right now we are having them getting ready for the National That's Assembly. Right. Yeah, going to Parliament. And, and, yes. I, and I think you might have like seen it. a little bit on the Facebook yesterday, yes. you know. And the kids are excited to, to discuss yes. their issues. Yeah. But what I liked about the whole thing was how happy and proud the parents were. Yes. Because it was a call. It was a call for a, right over the country. And for the children who got selected, the parents were extremely happy exactly. that their child was the selected child for, for, yes. for parliament, you know, yes. and to, to, for their voices yes. to be heard and so on and so forth. Yes. So it's really and truly, it's, it's like the love and hate thing. No, it's, exactly. a, it's a thin <laughs> line between the, the, the two. You don't want them and to have a voice, but you want them to be successful. You know, yes. so it's, 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 it's a thin line. So it's really and truly to, to help parents to understand that um, it's not children taking over, and it's also, yeah. and that is why you have to talk about responsibility and respect, yeah. because you cannot be disrespectful to your parent. And of course, children, I know, you know, like, I, I remember Canon Flowers saying to me, Daddy, grandson, tell her, you can't beat me, you know, daddy, because we have rights. Mm -hmm. I'm granddad, we have rights, mm -hmm. you know, and say so you are teaching rights, and no, you know, so you know what Canon is. <laughs> but the thing is, is that it's how, you know, the, how, how, people are, how people are interpreting this, how children yeah. are feeling empowered in Mm -hmm. But as you said, so vulnerable in, in yeah. other ways, you know. Yeah. So we have to strike the balance. So as Diana rightfully said, the awareness has been out there. It is there, everybody. Knows. But we have to do, we have to move from point A yeah. to point B yeah. and, and do the next steps. You know, yeah. we, we have to do the next steps. Because we have to even look at, because now we're also looking at the whole issue of early marriages yes. and child unions mm -hmm. and and um, which still happens <coughs> today which, no still, which is very yes. very much happening today yes. and so. not necessarily only in certain cultures but i think it's the last it. the last survey the last thing that go heaven did for us mm -hmm. really and really showed that in fact it is happening oh, in all cultures even in urban areas mm -hmm. even in yes. urban areas yeah. and when we look at who are some of the drivers and, and, and what is actually causing these things. You know? So there is so much work to be done 30 years later. I, I know that a lot has, has, um, has, has happened, a lot has changed, yeah. but there is still a lot of work to do. If in particularly for us at the NCFC, in, in, in regards to our children's agenda, mm -hmm. where we say at 2030, children should be living in the best place in the world, we have a lot of work to do. The NCFC still has mm -hmm. a lot of work to do, along with our partners, yeah. and so on and so forth. So, you know, so. Yes, yeah. Ms. Arthur, sorry. Just to continue the conversation, <laughs> I just wanted to add in terms of, of initiatives. 
um, through our community and parenting empowerment program. Um, we are one of the deliverers of parenting. Yeah. And I must say that the parents who do come um, to the actual sessions um, are very participatory. And yeah. they talk about, well, why didn't I do this a long time ago? Yeah. And so we want to reassure parents that, you know, you might be thinking, why should I go to a parenting class? What can they teach me? And it can <laughs> be a very empowering thing for you to look at yourself. And often these sessions cause you to step back and look at yourself, to look at different children because what works at one child will not work with that all children mm -hmm. and you will learn to add to your toolkit you yeah. know you already have resources within you and you'll add to that toolkit in yeah. terms of how do you apply and become a better parent and um we also um are working with the early childhood technical working group mm -hmm. um in looking at the whole aspect of early childhood development Mm -hmm. and, and even though we're looking at interventions at, at when they're already adolescents and older, we want to start earlier for the next generation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so we're looking at if we want to form connections, how do we do this very early in terms of that first thousand days of a child's life? Yeah. Um, and how do we teach parents to bond? Sometimes people think, oh, for mothers, that's a natural thing to bond. And it's, it is not always the case. No. And also fathers have a role to play in terms of early bonding as well. And, and, and all the research is telling you that if you bond early, you prevent some of the later problems yeah. that comes from disconnection. Mm -hmm. And um, through the Early Childhood Technical Working Group and with support from UNICEF, we've just hired um, what we call Care for Child Development Facilitators. Mm. They're currently going through training mm -hmm. now Okay. And what we want to do is, is have a targeted approach countrywide to look at training up so that we can begin to teach parents how to bond. And it's a simple thing as how to make eye contact with your how baby. To play with them. You know, and, and when you're able to see that when they actually make the eye contact, how happy that parent is that I can yeah. connect with my baby. Because sometimes you might have a baby who's crying and the parents get frustrated, like, I don't know what to do with this baby, it just keeps crying. Yeah. You know, and a simple thing as how to cuddle your baby, it seems simple, yeah. but it can make all the difference in terms of early bonding. You know, I think that one thing we can say, <coughs> um, with a clear assumption here, but we can say, is that we all want good for children mm -hmm. across the country mm -hmm. from parents to wider communities yes. you look at a child the, the, I don't even want to know how small the percentage is that people actually um, the majority want these children to thrive yes. survive and be successful yes, yes. and so I think it takes a collective effort and it means conversations like this and it means continuously talking about what we can do, what we need to do, and being very honest of where the gaps are. So mm -hmm. we do appreciate you coming in this morning mm -hmm. and having this talk with us. Right? Thank you. Be before we wrap up, just mm. to just add, um, while we are doing strengthening the national responses, not to forget those that are most vulnerable, because we may need different approaches for children in, mi children in migrant populations, um, children who are parents of disabilities, um, children who are in remote communities. We are seeing that the national programs are not reaching those children. So we need to have different approaches and different yeah. ways of engaging All those right. communities. And Thank I, you. And I want to never forget that if you see something that is concerning, that please report it. That's yeah. the only way that families can yeah. begin to start in terms of interventions, yeah. if you report it. All right. Thank you. We are going to go ahead and take a break now. When we come back, we'll be joined by representatives of the Ministry of Health to talk about infection control. So please stay tuned.